You don't want to fight against the U.S., you mean? But they are starting to lean that way. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have Harley Schlanger. Uh, he is in Austria, and a major meeting he recently had, so he's going to detail that. Uh, Harley, let's start with the top. Uh, you had a very interesting comment you made just before we went on air about the meeting between the European nations and China. What is, what's the outcome of that meeting? Well, we had a conference that uh, featured uh, Mrs. LaRouche, who's the head of our German organization, uh, I was there representing the United States and Mr. LaRouche, <laughs> excuse me, and Jacques Cheminade, former presidential candidate for France, was there representing France. We had the head of a new political party in Greece, which has gone from nowhere to about 8% of the polls because it's anti-Euro. Uh, we had a uh, group of three people from Florence, Italy, the Tuscany Regional Council, which has voted to adopt Glass-Steagall as their major issue. Uh, we had a, a woman from Switzerland who's leading the national referendum to have a referendum on the ballot to impose Glass-Steagall even if the government opposes it. And in Switzerland, referendums work. We had a, a leading French military official there. We had people from Sweden, Denmark, uh, Spain, Cyprus. And we had a Chinese fellow. And, and this is an interesting case because most of the discussion was about the economy. And what Mrs. LaRouche said is there are three significant developments in the world that are hopeful. The first is the fight for Glass-Steagall in the United States. The second is the extraordinary statement from Pope Francis attacking the idolatry of money. He sounded as though he were sitting in on a discussion with you and me on this weekly show, right. uh, what he said in his exhortation. And third, the Chinese mobilization for the new Silk Road. Not just that they support it, but that they're actually preparing to build high-speed rail systems through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. They're working on this with India, uh, through the Middle East, into Europe. And they're saying that this design came from Mr. LaRouche. So on these issues, we're seeing significant change. Now then also, I'm sure you caught what happened that completely drove the European Union up the wall, which is Ukraine said they don't want to join the European Union. They want to go to an alliance instead with Russia. Now, Ukraine is not a small country. It's 55, 60 million people. And what the, pre the president said is, look, we see what the EU is doing to Greece, Italy, and Spain. Why should we have them do that to us? Right, exactly. And instead, he's on his way to China, and then he's going to stop in Russia on the way back. Now, meanwhile, the George Soros networks, with the American ambassador are leading demonstrations in Kiev against the government. And the main people in the street are anti-Semitic, anti-Russian fascists. They're the ones who are supporting who the American, pres the, the American uh, ambassador is rallying with. Really? Yeah. Am am and so the Ukraine press is saying, this is democracy, that if a parliament, which is an elected parliament, makes a decision, mainly not to go with the uh, European Union. You're going to try and override that through demonstrations in the street of minority, of a minority, uh, minority part of the population? I don't what think happens so. to one man, one vote? Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen anyway. It's basically, what we're seeing is the, the death throes of the dragon system of the financial hegemony yep. of the Fed Reserve. Now, of course, on the other that's side... That's exactly it. <clears throat> well, that, we exactly, on the other side... The, the, but that's an important the, point, and let me just amplify that. Yeah. If you look at Europe, the only reason Europe hasn't fallen apart already is massive intervention in the form of money coming from the U.S. Federal Reserve in the form of bailouts and quantitative easing. Now, the same thing's true in the United States. In the U.S., we're told we have a housing recovery. Do you know that 4,400,000 of the houses sold in the last year were bought by hedge funds, and they're turning them into rental properties? Oh, we're told no. we have a stock market boom that's a sign of a good economy. Well, people are buying stock in companies like Twitter, which don't produce anything and haven't ever made a penny. This is not a, a, a solid economic development. And so... We are seeing the death throes. The term you use is exactly right of the yeah. transatlantic system. No, and the I, question I is, say is, is there something to replace it? 
I want to say something on the other side. I just had recently had on the program yesterday Lowell Ponte, who wrote the book The Great Withdrawal with Craig Smith. And it turns out that the Chinese have actually outdebted both the European Central Bank, <clears throat> the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is really European, uh, the um, Japanese uh, crazy spending and multiplication of their debt under the Abe government, all of them collectively can't even e- don't even equal the amount of debt that's expanded in China. China has gone crazy, and although we don't hear much news about it, and they're building some infrastructure in China, China is on a buying spree to buy debt everywhere and to buy everything they can from theaters in America, literally theaters where you show movies, to farms, to everything they can get their paws on. And, they're, uh, buying, the China, they're buying great farmland, and you, they're not buying it in Ukraine. They're leasing it. <laughs> right. And, Same and, thing and in Brazil and elsewhere. They, to work there. Right. And so what's happening is everywhere, China is literally printing money, like the Fed Reserve, out of thin air and buying everything they can on the planet. They are trying to literally, by the very process of the centrally controlled communist economy, printing enough money to literally outprint the Fed Reserve. That's their their point. They're trying to see if they can catch up to the total amount of debt created with the U.S. dollar, which is neither U.S. nor a U.S. federal currency. But there, there is so one difference, Bill, and you know this is important. They're, most of what they're spending on is something physical, whereas in this country, we're buying worthless paper. That's what uh, the yeah, Federal Reserve it, it, is well, doing. Exactly. They're putting rail lines through Tanzania. They're, they're buying farmland in Brazil. They're buying coal, uh, copper mines in, in Argentina. They're, you know, whatever. They're buying things up that are physical properties. They built 100,000 warehouses in the last five years just to store the physical material that they have that they're stockpiling in China. It's crazy. They, the Chinese are on a spending spree. They're not just buying the physical. They're buying debt. They are leveraged into the uh, derivatives market, into the debt market for other currencies like crazy because they're vying to become part of the new world currency. They want to have a new world currency that is a balance between the Chinese yuan and the Fed Reserve note. And right now it's not exchangeable. They have to exchange it, and that's why they're sitting up bilateral deals. So recently they even threatened Australia... They threatened the Australian government because they allowed uh, Darwin, which is the north part of Australia, to house an expanded U.S. military presence. So uh, the the, the Chinese are on an aggressive stance right now that I think is multi-track. On the one hand, they want to buy theaters. On the other hand, they're having a military uh, presence where they actually are threatening war. Well, the fact is, on their flank, they have Japan, which is the third nuclear power. It's not Israel. It's Japan. And people may or may not know this, but the Israelis were working in collaboration with the Japanese, which is why Fukushima Daiichi occurred. They were building in all these plants what's called breeder-type reactors to create plutonium detonators for nuclear warheads. And in fact, in reactor number three, which is a MOX reactor, that's exactly what was going on, which is why much of it was hidden by FETEPCO. Uh, And the the Japanese uh, are enraged by what's going on with China, and this... ADIZ, which Obama's agreed to, to make our airliners, or commercial airliners, have to agree to their airline notification so they don't have military jets showing up on their wingtips. The Chinese are just asking for trouble. And uh, they'll play these kind of games, but it's gonna, the time is going to run out on them because what's happening, what I hear from my sources, is that multinational corporations are pulling business like crazy out of China and sending it to India, primarily in Indonesia. The Chinese are going to choke on the number of new graduates they have that they can't employ. So for every one job they generate in China, they have nine new to ten new graduates that cannot get work. So they're they're more likely to have an internal revolution in China than they are in a Middle Eastern country. That's how bad it is. Well, China has some problems, but after the break, I'm going to dispute some of these things because the Chinese don't want to have to go to war. It's, it's Obama no, who's they're not going to go to war. the forward positions with the air-sea battle document, which the Pentagon is opposing. Yeah, well, uh, those, those forward positions have been there since the Second World War. That's not really the issue. The war is not the issue. It's all a dance. The real issue behind the scene is the economy. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. Bad. There was something so pleasant about that Welcome back, and so Harley, 
I, I made a, n- a number of statements, though. Those are often statements I'm quoting from other experts I've had on this program where I've done research. And there's problems in different countries. China's problem right now, is biggest problem, is actually the Fed Reserve that basically, through some of these agreements like the Trans-Pacific Agreement that Obama's pushing that will destroy our sovereignty, is also there to destroy J- China's sovereignty over its own centrally yeah. controlled communist economy. And the Chinese are, are freaked out by it because they're not stupid. They realize that in the sandbox of the world economy, the Fed Reserve wants to become the World Reserve Bank and wants to take over. And the Chinese have been printing money like it's going out of style. They actually have expanded their total debt more than all of the other economies on Earth in the last five years. But let's, so, let's, let's take a step back for a second and look at the, the more profound reality that, that China is facing, but also what we're facing. The argument that somehow we're, we've recovered from 2008 is a total lie. The argument that the U.S. economy is having slow but steady growth is a lie. And the, it, it's not just that the Federal Reserve is trying to establish itself as a global bank. The Federal Reserve is, an, is a tool that's used by the private banks. What we're right. talking about is 16 of the so-called too-big-to-fail banks, maybe half a dozen insurance companies, and hedge funds like Blackstone Group, which is totally integrated with Deutsche Bank. Right. And these banks are on the verge of blowout. And so oh, what yeah. they're doing is they're looking for every cent of liquidity they can get. And they had tried to get... Russia to support the trans-European, transatlantic system. They tried to get China to do it. They wouldn't do it because the, the Chinese know that they've got to deal with an internal problem, which is that you're trying to come out from under you know, 40 years of a totally planned economy under Maoist dictates. And they're trying to bring in certain kinds of entrepreneurial capabilities. And, and the Chinese people are very entrepreneurial. The question is how to generate the credit for that. And the Chinese government is extending credit, but it's also extending credit internally for developments. Now, right. what they see is that the, what the Russians are doing, I mean, what the, the Federal Reserve and what the Wall Street banks have tried to do is get China to be totally integrated into the Western system by... Uh, unleashing their banks by by decoupling their banks from the government. Right. And the Chinese know that if they do that, whatever benefits they've had in the last 20 years will be lost overnight. Right. So the Chinese are talking to other countries that are pretty poor countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. And what, what they're talking about is pooling resources for development projects, which include... Uh, the most modern nuclear power plants, high-speed rail systems, uh, space technology, advanced medical centers, you know, medical research centers of the kind that we're t- shutting down, they're trying to open. I-, I just was talking to a doctor the other day who said that he and several of his colleagues who are doing cancer research in Cleveland are heading to China for a year. And if they like the program, they're going to start recruiting American doctors to go over there. So... You know, the, the, the problem, the biggest problem we have with China is that we are intent on destroying ourselves. As long as we have Obama in the White House, as long as we have Jamie Dimon, who's a, one of the biggest crooks in the world, running free, and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, and Moynihan of Bank of America, as long as these guys are allowed to continue to carry out swindles against the American people, then we're putting other countries in difficulty, but we're destroying our own nation. Yeah, but, so but maybe what, that's the goal. It's like uh, one of the thing comments we made the other day when we had uh, Wayne Allen Root on is that Obamacare is not a failure. It's a remarkable success, just like the 2008 uh, well, it's collapse. It's doing what it's intended to do. Exactly. The 1929 collapse was on purpose. My grandfather, when I was 14, who was, he was a millionaire. He's a very smart guy. Uh, he told me specifically, and he lived outside of Chicago, he told me specifically that the big banks decided it was time to collapse the small banks. They all did it on concert. It was not something that spontaneously happened. The same way as okay, all these things are by design, just like the wars are all banker wars. Every war but is this, let, me, let me tell you, this wars. is one of the things we discussed this weekend at the conference, where we had some bankers there, and these are regional bankers from Europe, and what they're saying is the intention of the European Central Bank and its bail-in policy 
is to create one pool of money under what's called a single resolution mechanism so that the bureaucrats in Brussels can say, look, we can't afford to let BNP Paribas or Royal Bank of Scotland or Deutsche Bank collapse. Therefore, we're going to draw upon money from what are called the Sparkassen banks, which are savings banks. They still have like mortgage savings and loans in Germany and Austria. They're saying we're going to go to the regional banks, which are relatively, you see, the problem is the big banks are totally liquid. They've got tons of liquidity, thanks to the Federal Reserve and their own uh, ramping up of leverage with each other. But they're insolvent. Now, the smaller banks are starved for liquidity, but they're totally solvent because they've been investing in local entrepreneurs and business and construction and things of that sort. So the question now is, will this bail-in, bail-out quantitative easing regime break the backs of governments completely, or will governments be forced to come out and defend their people? That's the big fight we in the West have. Exactly. And that's why we've got word, to get rid of Obama. Well, see, what's happening in Europe is a laboratory. And you mentioned a few weeks ago that they were talking about a bail-in of up to 17% of the economy, of the personal yeah. savings, the mortgages, your bank accounts of everybody in Europe. How is that proceeding? Is what, What's going on there now? Well, let me tell you something. That I mean, they have 20 different bail-in schemes. That's one of them. And that's actually been drafted in the legislation in France. And it's being held off because Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, said, until the situation in Germany is settled, so that we know there's a new government in Germany that will keep the bailouts going, we can't publicize the bail-ins. Of course, he said that at a public press conference, so everyone knows about the bail-ins. But let me tell you one of the things, just to give you a sense of what the European Union does. Greece has been under austerity for five years. The country's a shambles. Right. And we had leaders of new parties there. Greece produces enough food to provide 100% self-sufficiency in Greece. But under the euro system, they're forced to export 75% of that. And with the money they make in return, it's not enough to replace what they're selling. So one-third of the population of Greece goes to bed hungry every night. Now, this is a modern country. It's got some backward areas in the peasantry, but I'm talking about the cities. One out of three school children requires uh, special government or church food in the morning because they come to school without eating. How can children sit through school days when they're hungry? Now, this is just one example of what's happening in Greece. They're shutting down the hospitals. Greek doctors are working as nurses now in Germany and France and, and other countries because they can't be hired in Greece anymore. Now, right. But, but, but Greece let's get the point. Exception. The point is, the point that you made before, and I want to re reiterate it, is the real intention of the bankers and the global elite is to impoverish the population, destroy their health, and then kill them. It's eugenics. Let's call that what it is. And they're trying to do it to the Chinese now. Let's go, yeah. Let's get into it. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, I guess the, the bottom line here is as we're heading into 2014. Uh, the Fed Reserve basically is trying to strong arm China and Russia that they have to turn over their centrally controlled economies. And the Chinese are creating tons of credit, which is building up a business primarily for the 82 million Communist Party members. And the rest of the population are getting pretty antsy because nine to 10 new jobs are being, or, or employees are being created from colleges and universities and engineering. They graduate more engineers from Beijing alone than all our PhDs and engineers in the United States every year. Just in one area, Beijing. We're not even talking about Shandong or Shanghai or other major centers in, in China, along that we call the Dragon Cities. So, but you see, this where, is, a, this where, is where, a model that we used to have. It's, it's not a bad model. You know, the problem right. we have in this country is we're turning out people in so-called management uh, studies, and what are they going to manage? Bankruptcies. You know, we're uh -huh. not turning out engineers. We're not planning to. Uh, have the kind of capabilities to rebuild the infrastructure and develop the machine tool sector. 
But, you know, the, this exactly. is something, when, well, when you look at what's I, happening... Yeah, this is why Little Rouge's uh, vision of the Nawapa and super high-speed rail and even high-speed uh, container traffic going uh, across the United States so that you can get containers across the country quickly. Uh, these kind of infrastructure projects that redistribute water, power, and energy, it would transform America, but this is being done in China, to, at least to some extent. And uh, what the Chinese are trying to do is they want to integrate their economy with the world economy uh, they're on a buying spree right now, and I think that there's going to be a big conflict. I think until they finally come to a uh, detente with with uh, the Federal Reserve and with America, this is going to get uglier and uglier, and what's going to happen is a lot of transnational business will pull out of China, and they're going to have an internal collapse. And I don't know if yeah, it's two see, or five another, or ten years. another option, which is why, why do you assume the United States is always going to be under this banker's dictatorship? You know, this is what I think... The, the Chinese and the Russians, to the extent they're hoping to avoid darker times, they're hoping we in the United States will stop being so insane that we allow these bankers to destroy us. Now, I think what, what happened in a House hearing yesterday, U.S. Congress hearing yesterday, shows right. the problem beautifully. There was a hearing where Jonathan Turley, a George Washington University law professor, who tends to be left of center, He's considered a liberal. He's a consultant with CNN. But I think he's an actually an honest constitutional lawyer. He testified that Obama has committed numerous impeachable offenses in his efforts to extend the power of the presidency. And what he put before the Congress was a devastating picture of Obama's absolute lack of regard for the U.S. Constitution. Right. And the Republicans were lapping it up, except for one problem. None of them said, well, we should move to impeach the bum. Turley said, for example, one Democrat said, can you give me an example of an actual impeachable offense? And Turley said the most blatant one is Libya, right. where Obama violated the War Powers Act and put in power a government which killed our ambassador and is spreading weapons to al-Qaeda throughout the, the Middle East. Right. Now, the, the Democrats shut up at that. Not a single Republican said, well, why don't we use that to draft a bill of impeachment? That's because so they're collaborating the right behind the scenes. You see, the Republicans are collaborating, it's just like Bonner is having private meetings for the last two years to make sure the monies are appropriate for year one of Obamacare, which is an abomination. And the Republicans behind the scenes are actually were the initial authors of a good part of the process called Obamacare. Exactly, really understand because it. yeah. it's a private insurance corporation. You know, in, in right. Europe, when where people are saying, well, what's the big fuss over Obamacare? Why are Americans so opposed to it? And I said, suppose you had a law passed in Germany which said no more government health insurance. Starting now, you, by law, will have to buy private insurance. Right. And people say, well, that would be terrible. I said, well, that's what Obamacare is. No, no, Obamacare is government insurance, isn't it? No, it's And this not. is what, no. see, the, a lot of yeah. poor, desperate people were led to believe that by Obama's promises right. and by the fact that the Republicans keep attacking Obamacare as a government health takeover. Uh, it's the exact opposite. The, the Obamacare was originally written up as a Republican plan. Obama Trump, is the he best was the one who put it in in Massachusetts. Exactly. It was, in fact, it was the, the Republicans are laughing all the way to the bank because they have the punching bag of Obama doing exactly what they plan to do, which is hand it over to corporate health care. And here's, here's the interesting, most important thing about it. This is why they won't move to impeach Obama. It's right. the same reason that Democrats wouldn't do anything to impeach Bush, who Turley said was also impeachable because he went to war while lying about uh, weapons of mass destruction. Exactly. Now, what I call him Colin Bowell, you know? <laughs> yeah. What, what the Democrats did in 2006 to 2008, or 2004 to 2008, after losing the election in 2004, is they said, well, let's let Bush screw everything up. We'll point out his screw-ups, and then we'll win the election in 2008. That's exactly what happened. Now, are we right. better off because those Democrats took over? Now, what would happen 
if we continue in this direction, assuming we don't end up in a, a total collapse and a nuclear war, in 2016, if the Republicans win because the Democrats screwed everything up, what's the Republican alternative? See, this is the kind of corrupt opportunism in both right. parties that's destroying the nation. And, right. and, and laughing it, all the way to... are the insurance companies and the Wall Street banks and the oil cartels and the food cartels. They love it because that's what they're orchestrating. Well, the, the average congressman makes three times as much as the highest paid horror, horror uh, on planet Earth. And the fact is that these politicians are prostitutes. It doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican. They're prostitutes of transnational corporations, and healthcare in America is larger than the next five industries, not just in America, but on the planet. It's ridiculous. And guess who wrote these, uh, and, these, and, these plans? It was written by big corporations. Being done when they say they're actually trying to bring the costs under control. The way they're bringing the costs under control is not paying for health care. Exactly. And, and, and what happens collecting happening? the insurance money. What people have been doing now is they're shoving people off Medicare, which is a prepaid plan by people who privately paid for Medicare during their life. The money's being stolen, $800 billion over a decade, to pay for for state Medicaid, which is basically catastrophic insurance. And when you're shoved on this, and of course, in Obamacare, when you're given state Medicaid in these programs that they have, they move you from Obamacare to memory care to hospice, which is to murder you. So what they're going to well, do is and not only care. that, but the closing of hospitals, which is going on at record levels, the doctors who are being fired by insurance companies, the doctors who are quitting because they can't tolerate this, we're facing an incredible health emergency. And what we're right. already seeing, and I'm sure you know this very well, Dr. Deagle, in rural counties, we're seeing a drop in life expectancy. Well, actually, you'll see a rise in life expectancy in the long run because they'll realize they have personal responsibility. They need clean water, clean air, exercise, and nutraceuticals, and they need to have non-GMO food. Medical doctors prescribing toxic polypharmacy is killing people. And it's the big drug companies and the big insurance carriers. And the medical system, by the way, is not helping. And that's all doctors are allowed to prescribe because doctors who try to do naturopathic curing or preventive well, I, medicine, yeah, they get the, the, thrown aside. Well, the fact is, I'm, I'm trained as a surgeon, trained as an intensivist, and there's, those things are valuable, and I worked in a burn unit. But there's a ton of medical stuff that has no basis in logic. In fact, the American Murder Association, I call them, they said one-third of surgery has no validity in scientific fact. And no, no, no chronic condition should ever be treated with toxic polypharmacy. They should find what your genetic defects, your organic acids, metabolism, they should correct it with, with nutritional Yeah, activity. but then you don't make the money by having people dependent for life on medication. Well, that's the point. The point is that we don't really have a healthcare system. We have what's called a morbid, uh, you know, pre-embalming death care system. You know, it's not a healthcare system, and this system is sucking the country dry. Also, work comp costs are highest in the world. No wonder we can't compete with Canada and countries right beside us even. Right. Okay. The uh, foundation, LaRouche Foundation, has LaRouche, L A R O U C H E P A C dot com and LaRouche P U B dot com for the executive intelligence review. There's a number they can contact too here in America uh, if they need to get more active because I believe the LaRouche uh, approach is ask better questions, think about the future of mankind, not just a quote one country. I mean, we'll talk about a collective of strong nations, not a globalist economy run by bankers, which are basically primarily trying to kill us. They don't just want to kill Americans or Europeans, they want to kill the Chinese. They manipulate economies because austerity, fascism, and war are their greatest tools to actually get more control. And they don't just want all the money and power, they want death. They aren't just satisfied well, I, I, with... You know, this, this question of the relationship between a nation to the world, a strong nation that's based on moral judgments and physical economy isn't afraid to deal with other nations. And in fact, it's not threatened if other nations adopt its policies. You know, our founding fathers, George Washington, said we don't want to get involved with other countries, but we would like to encourage other countries to study our model and adopt it. Exactly. And you, you can't impose a model 
We know that now. How many times have we tried to impose our model, Afghanistan, Iraq? It doesn't work. You exactly. can't impose at the point of a gun an idea of, of intellectual and moral freedom. Exactly. In other words, you just replace one strong man for another, and you create another war that causes more destruction, more balkanization of the whole area. And now, of course, our whole idea is we brought some of our worst ideas of, of a market economy to the communist Chinese, and so they have a superheated economy, and now the global bankers are putting the what I call the headlock on China, saying, now, if you don't play our game our way, we're just going to suck out the blood out of your economy, you'll have no market. That's what's happening with China well, right and, now. Uh, and, you know, it, it, when you're talking about paper tigers, right now the U.S. is a paper tiger. Under Bush and Obama, our military has really been downgraded. I don't mean our, our nuclear capability, because we can extinguish the planet easily. But our ability to, to fight and win a, a defined, limited war is very much weekened. Uh, yeah, by they, don't, they don't want them to win at all. Wars they, they've always, they've always, in Vietnam, they never wanted America to win a war. Even no, the they war wanted Korea, the meat they were, grinders. They wanted to the grind grinders. down our country That's, and the, to bankrupt us. And have our men come back with their arms and legs blown off because they have central body armor on. They don't want to have America and just go swiftly in a... They don't want America to defeat the drug trade or defeat our yeah. enemies and then kind of clean out and or have our soldiers that are designed to kill people and break things, uh, policing so they get blown up by criminals and by drug lords that are actually collaborating with us because we make sure they continue to get arms and continue to sell their drugs so they still have a cash flow. This is what's going on in Afghanistan. That's why it's so duplicitous that one to two trillion dollars a year is through our CIA and working in collaboration with their military MI5 and MI6 and these European bankers to wash this money into blackout projects. It's really but, but let me, horrendous. Let me, give you a, like, let me give you a picture of a couple things that, that can be done. Because the, there, there are now Glass-Steagall bills all over Europe. We've got Glass-Steagall in the U.S. Congress. And what's starting to happen is that as Democrats are beginning to realize that Obama's the anchor around their neck, by sticking with him, <laughs> they're going to go yeah. down. And so a number of uh, 15 Democratic senators who are up for re-election tried to get Obama to drop Obamacare, to change it drastically, and he wouldn't do it. Now, out of this grouping, you've got a few Democratic senators who say, we've got to defeat Wall Street, and we're going to do it with Glass-Steagall. And we've got to get some Republicans to stop being such damn idiots who know that Obama's impeachable. They know he's wrecking the country, and yet they go along with him because they want their money, their cut from Wall Street. And so we need a, a revival of the, the spirit of the Declaration of Independence in the United States, declaring our independence of the imperial system and our independence of the globalized system. Now, what I was telling you before about TAFTA, under TAFTA, which is the trade agreement with Europe, the United States loses its power over every sector of the economy except banking. Only in banking, it's not brought under the TAFTA because the banks are above TAFTA. The banks are essentially the primus inter pares, the, the number one, the king among kings. There's nothing to restrict the banks. Now, at this point, there, are, there was another agreement that was a slap on the wrist over LIBOR. Jamie Dimon got his slap on the wrist over mortgage fraud. Um, they now say the Volcker rule in Dodd-Frank is completed, and this is tough regulation, which is a lie. It's not regulation at all. It's written by the people who are supposed to be regulated. Uh, but what we do have, besides Elizabeth Warren and others fighting for Glass-Steagall, we have some judges in New York who are rejecting the agreement signed between the banks and the Securities and Exchange Commission and other regulators because they're saying that we're not going to accept fines unless we have a determination of did they actually commit fraud. And if they did, why are we just fining them? And so there's a Judge Rakoff in Brooklyn. There's a, a Judge... Uh, I can't remember the other, Judge Gleason, who's the one who turned down the Citibank plea bargain. And these judges are saying to the Congress, you passed laws that these banks are violating. Why aren't you doing something about it? All we can do is not allow the agreements to go through. 
But the Congress is the one that has to make sure these laws are enforced. And the, and the executive branch, of course, also, but the executive branch is totally on the side of the crooks. So there are some things that are, that are positive, but we've got to have an outcry from the American people. We want our independence back, our independence from Wall Street, our independence from the city of London. Well, I think that the, 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 this is, it's pulling one finger at a time off of the scepter that Obama is wielding for George Soros and the bankers. And the first finger is to get Glass-Steagall. And the second finger is to, to talk about if you want to provide health care for all Americans, don't try to pretend that Obamacare is like socialized health care. It's not. It's corporate health care. And it's, a, it's eugenic care. Uh, it would make the Nazis during the Second World War blush and say, this is wrong. Because yeah, the Nazis had to do it in secret. Exactly. The initial, and, and, the initial euthanasia <laughs> policy in the Tiergarten uh, 4 uh, agreement was done behind closed doors because they right. wouldn't do it out in the open the way Obama is. The thing about it, I'm amazed about Obama, though, he doesn't make it clear enough that the original plan, and he did a bit when the election with Romney, but the fact that this plan is corporate. In fact, Obama is basically a, a middle manager. He doesn't really do anything. He just kind of spouts, you know, teleprompter statements. Because, in fact, what, this plan was written by a ba battalion of attorneys for drug companies and for insurance carriers, period. And, and, and these fact, are the one people of the, who worked out of Baucus's office. Uh, right. These are the people who worked out of the White House, like Ezekiel or Ezekiel Emanuel. <laughs> yeah, I like that um, one, Ezekiel. But yeah. look, you know, the, the key is the American people finally have to say, we've had it. And we've seen yeah. moments of that, but we haven't seen it sustained. And if we could get a sustained commitment well, I, uh, to clean up our nation, that? we could do it. Let's just... Let's do Glass-Steagall in each state. If we started with big states like Texas and California, they realize that whether it's a Republican or Democratic state, this is the first step to actually getting solvency back to your state. Well, we you have know, a Glass-Steagall bill before the California legislature. So if your listeners in California want to get involved in that, uh, let me give them the toll-free number. It's 800-922-2907. If you live in California, we have a Glass-Steagall bill that's going to come up in January. Join us to go in and, and really put some pressure on those legislators. So it's 800-922-2907. Yeah, and that's where I think if it starts in the states, and enough states do this, it will put a, a the, I call the nine-inch silver spikes with the heart of the vampiric banking system. Because once that's done, the too big to jail banks will start to be jailed. We won't just have fines yeah, you know, for James you know, Diamond. The, you know the great thing about it? As soon as that bill was introduced, J.P. Morgan Chase and the California Bankers Association went to the legislator and said, get rid of this bill. You can't do it. We're not going to accept it. And he said, right. sorry, it's already filed and you can't scare me. Right. And not only that, once this happens and they take somebody like Jamie Diamond and they throw these guys into a non-padded concrete cell with a steel toilet, We're it's in a whole over new for the banks. It's a whole new ball game. You take these boards of directors and you actually say, sorry, you're not going to your yacht, you're going to a cell. It's going to be a different yep. story, won't it? That's right. That's what needs to happen. Yep. Yeah, That's and Obama, Obama's impeachment is the second finger. Impeach Obama, recall Obamacare, and put in a national health plan that even is better than, quote, socialized medicine in Canada. And or and Glass-Steagall's number one, the first finger off the hand, the scepter is Glass-Steagall. The second one is impeachment. Amazing. Thank you, Henry. We'll have another program next week. Take care. Hour three, Mark Gaffney, JFK assassination, and much more.